Hercules about 10 feet off, moving down the side. Roger. Okay, Hercules is past the stern. Roger. Hercules is flagging off to the port side right now. Roger that. Pilots, are you ready to turn on Adelina? Okay, Hercules is centered on the stern. Roger. Atalanta's in the water. Roger.
Eagle Van Winch, all stop five zero meters. Roger, we are ready for control. You have control. Winch copies, you have control. Roger.
This is an audio slate for dive H2003, Expedition 154. UTC time is 10.49.25. Mark.
Hello to everyone joining from around the world. Thank you so much for tuning in on our second dive. We are still um, launching or descending the ROVs and doing some operational things, but we'll be back with more audio in a minute. Thank you. Science team, can you hear me? Yep. Yep. 
Roger. It's Hans. I know it's Hans. <laughs> Hey, Elsa, do you want me to show you a little bit about data logging over here? Awesome.
Mic check, mic check. Check, 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 check. <laughs> 30 meters a minute, dude. 30 meters a minute. 32, actually. Okay, you have to hold your hand on it. You have to hold your hand on it. <laughs> <coughs> that, as you can see right here, is highly illegal. So, yeah, I would advise you to at least keep a hand on it. You don't have to actually hold the winch, but yeah, you have to maintain speed. What's that? It's right there. He doesn't let it go far. Oh my god, hip. Science nav. Nav? I just wanted to check if you guys were talking because I couldn't hear you. If you're on SPL. Nope. No SPL chatter yet. Uh, I now had, I have Rennie's stick to point things out. Stick Roger. Single digits, Jacob, single digits. 20 meters, I'm winning the race. You want me to get some more tape to put on that stick? Here, look, let me show you something. So you got it way on the edge over here. That's wonky if you put it here.
but then you bump it all the time. So we got to keep, you know, keep watching it. Uh, I'm going to take it away and break it. Oh, okay. That would be bad, bad luck. The stick has some serious history. Yeah. Let me see the. All right. No. If um, the ROVs are kind of descending at a steady pace now, um, and everything is operationally going well, <laughs> um, I was thinking Probably. we could go ahead and um, introduce our watch and just saying hello to everyone who's tuning in from the U.S., Australia, Germany, Portugal, Philippines, Egypt. Thank you so much for. Uh, joining us on the second dive of this expedition into Papa Hanao Mokokea Marine National Monument. I'll stop one more time. Um, this is the 12 midnight to, hand, right? <laughs> midnight to 4 a.m. watch, and we're really well, excited to be exploring gonna... with you today. Um, so we'll go ahead and introduce our team uh, for this watch. Uh, I'll go ahead and say hello. My name is Kara. I'm the Science Communication Fellow. So. Um, I'm here to kind of bring out some of the stories about exploration and help explain what kind of science is going on. And I'll go, I um, grew up in New York, but I currently live in Guam. So as I pass it around to everyone, uh, please feel free to share what your role is as well as um, where you came from before you were on the Nautilus. All right, I'll pass it to Roger. my colleague we'll on the left, Elsa. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Kara. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Elsa, and I'm from a little island in the Western Pacific called Palau. So in Palau, we say Ali for hello. So Ali, everybody, Ali. and good morning. Good morning. <laughs> We're here on the Dead Man's Watch, 12 to 4. <laughs> and um, feeling a lot of energy as we're descending. Uh, and I'm here on this watch as a supporting scientist. So I'm here to support um, any of my colleagues in the roles that they do, which includes science communication, data observation, and IDs. So very excited to be here. So yeah, I think I'll pass it off to our watch lead. Hans. Hello, everyone, and thank you for listening in. My name is Hans Van Tilburg. I'm with NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, and I am a marine archaeologist. And uh, I am here on the mission to support potential archaeological uh, objectives a little later on. This dive, of course, is going to be geologic and biologic in nature. My role is to support the science team as watch lead. I live in Honolulu, Hawaii. And uh, this is the first extended mission I've had on Nautilus, and it's a wonderful learning experience, I must say. The is at 913 meters right now, and we're descending to start this dive, I think, at 2,000 meters. Uh, 2,181 meters will be our drop point where we begin to go up this uh, seamount, the Loudoun Seamount. And I'll pass it on to our science lead, Upashana. Hello, uh, I'm Upashana. I am the biologist in the team. And good morning and welcome everybody to the second dive of this expedition. And uh, I'm a deep sea biologist studying uh, the evolution of a group of deep sea corals. Uh, I'm from India, a city called Kolkata, but currently I'm uh, doing my PhD, pursuing my PhD from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. And I'm l hopefully we'll have a very exciting dive, just like the first one. And with this, I'll pass on to Taylor. Hello, my name is Taylor Ann. I am the science manager and the data logger on this watch. I reside in California, Los Angeles, uh, but I originally come from Chicago, Illinois. Um, I have been with OET since 2019. I started as an ocean science intern uh, and I've been coming out every year since. 
Uh, so if you're interested in being an explorer like all of us here, I highly recommend checking out the website and the internship programs we have um, for scientists, engineers, communication fellows, literally any kind of background you have, you can get involved. So um, yeah, really excited for this dive and really excited to get to know um, my team a little bit more tonight during this blue water. Awesome, thank you guys so much for sharing. Um, we'll go ahead to the front row if anyone is uh, ready for that. Can I pass it to our video engineer? Yes, of course. Hi everyone, my name is Jaina Galvez. I am originally from Hilo, Hawaii. I now reside in Seattle, Washington. Um, yes, I'm here as a video engineer intern, uh, learning how to use all these systems and cameras. I'm very excited to be here with everybody. Um, yeah, when I'm, this is my first expedition with the Nautilus. Very excited to be here. When I'm not here, um, back in Seattle, I'm a filmmaker. Um, so yeah, very excited to be a part of this. Um, very honored to have gotten this internship and be here with you all. And I will pass it over to Jacob. Hello, my kaku. My name is Jacob Wesley. Uh, I am from Eva Beach on Oahu, uh, but I currently reside in Hilo, Hawaii, on the island, of the big island. Um, yeah, I'm a ROV engineering intern. I work for the Multi-Scale Environmental Graphical Analysis Lab, or the Mega Lab in Hilo, where we use photogrammetry to uh, try and character, character, characterize corals and um, just look at coral health. And super stoked to be here. To Papa Hanamoku Akeo. So I will pass it on to our ROV Hercules pilot, Dan. ROV operator sitting in the Hercules chair. My name's Dan. I uh, hail from uh, somewhere near the end of the pavement in Oregon. Originally born and raised in San Diego. Spent a bit of time in Northern California. Uh, got off the boat once in uh, Newport, Oregon. Fell in love with the place and uh, basically moved up there. I've been uh, working with OET since uh, 2018. Passing it along? Passing it along to Mia. Alrighty. My name's Mia. I'm serving in the navigator position. Um, I also am the sea star spotter now. <laughs> right. But non officially. <laughs> um, I official. hail from. It's official now. It's official. It's official. I have a stick now so I can point at it. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, I, uh, I'm from the DC area, but originally I grew up in Ohio and uh, rural Ohio, Carroll County. It's close to the West Virginia border. Um, and I moved around the state a bit, went to Miami University for undergrad, Ohio University for grad school. And this is my second trip with Nautilus. I was on two cruises ago. That was a, a mapping transit from uh, Cal uh, British Columbia, Canada to Honolulu as we got ready for the ROV dives uh, in the Hawaii area. And I feel Super honored to be here, especially in this very sacred place, and uh, not many people get get to come out here, and it's um, it's really great. And just so everyone knows, I don't have a deep sea background or oceanography background. I have done geospatial stuff for the past 15 years. Um, so you know, if you're into geography and this is something you want to do, don't feel intimidated. You can you know learn and and find a way to get on here even if you don't have an ocean background very cool thanks so much for sharing um as someone who does not have a geospatial background what does that really what does that mean like what kind of things do you learn um, in university when you're studying geography yeah so um it depends there are different fields of geography so my expertise I actually double majored in urban planning and more of political geography and took gis classes and when i went to grad school i continued doing research in the political cultural geography realm i said i wouldn't do a job as 
I wouldn't be a GIS analyst for my job or uh, career. And then, of course, that's what ended up happening <laughs> the past 15 years. Um, so, you know, just doing classes to, uh, you know, think about space and place and how things relate to each other, different uh, geospatial technology courses, like obviously GIS courses, um, remote sensing, you can, uh, learning Python is, is really great now. Um, so yeah, just there's a lot of different opportunities out there, physical geography, human geography, uh, they all lend themselves to doing this kind of work. Um, I think my cultural human geography background has been helpful um, when reading about the archaeology things we might be doing. So mm -hmm. I've been communicating with Hans and reading about the Battle of Midway. Um, and yeah, so being multidisciplinary um, has definitely helped uh, prepare me for this expedition. Wow, oh, that's awesome. And to any students that are listening in, um, GIS stands for Geographic Information System, if I, I believe so. Um, and those are like kind of different programs that help you look at maps and analyze data in different spaces. Um, the most simple GIS software, if you can consider like the most basic thing would be like Google Earth, right? Would you consider that GIS, Mia? Uh, yeah, more or less. Uh, you can create some points there. Um, it's most accessible. Now there's uh, Esri's the big company. They have a lot of things online. Um, NOAA and the companies, uh, the organizations that the data from these cruises go to uh, have a presence with um, ArcGIS Online. You can find the data. Um, there's also a program called QGIS, QGIS, and that one's free, public uh, domain, or you know, pub open to the public, open source. Um, so if you don't have access to ArcGIS uh, through a license, um, you can definitely check that out. There are tons of trainings online um, for free that you can take. Um, so highly recommend checking that out if mapping is of interest to you. Very cool, yeah. And um, lots of resources, like you said, online. When I was trying to learn GIS, I watched so many different YouTube videos, um, just trying to learn about like the different buttons and file saving formats. So, but it's very helpful skill. Um, so now we're in kind of like the mid water column, I guess. We were seeing some squids before, um, but definitely keep your eye out because in the past, we've seen some other pretty amazing stuff in this midwater, this blue water area before we get down to the bottom. Um, currently, Hercules is 1,200-ish meters, and we are descending to uh, 2,181 meters, so we're getting there. Um, in the meantime, um, I was thinking we could share a little bit about how your career journey has gotten this far, um, whatever point you're at. Uh, I know uh, our, our website has a lot of um, career profiles that you can check out, but can if you, you have any questions, left monitor? you can go ahead and put those in yep. the chat box and we can answer them more clearly. Um, so I was wondering, uh, Else, would you want to share about like how you started at Palau International Coral Reef Center? Yeah, thanks, Kara. So um, I don't think I mentioned that in my introduction, so thank you. Um, the organization that I'm with when I am not here on Nautilus is called the Palau International Coral Reef Center. So we're basically, uh, we assist uh, the government of Palau in conducting um, research marine. on marine resources, the marine resources of Palau, for the purpose of um, natural resource management. So I, uh, my role there is as a researcher, and um, the basically the work that I do is um, very interdisciplinary, so there's oh, yeah, uh, many no. different <laughs> We research projects out, uh, that I have been involved with. So right now people, uh, I'm here studying the deep sea, but um, other people a more typical there. project for me would be having to do with coral reefs and all of the associated ecosystems. So um, 
A more current one that I'm working on is a project in the mangroves. Uh, mangroves are a type of tree which can live, they live in the brackish areas, so um, where they are able to uh, live in both salt water and fresh water and deal with that. So um, quite a spectrum of projects that I work on. And how I got to that researcher position is that I actually started at the orga organization as a um, outreach and education officer. So I had a similar role as you, Kara. So I started off in science communication. And I found that that has been really helpful as I transitioned into a more research-based role because a lot of research is, again, just communicating um, in a way that people understand and um, taking concepts and making them a bit more understandable. So I mm. uh, had a bit of a, a unconventional way to get to research, and I'm still learning a lot, but um, that's how I got to where I am now. Don't want to take too much time. I could start off with the, <laughs> a little bit, go a little bit further back, but I'll pass it along maybe yeah. to our next person. Well, we, we, can, we have a lot of time. <laughs> we'll love to hear more about Palau uh, maybe the next time yeah. <laughs> or when we have more free time. Yeah. But very cool. It sounds like everyone has very interdisciplinary backgrounds. Um, Hans, how did you get involved in archaeology? Oh boy, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, absolutely by accident. I must say, I mean, oh. I grew up sailing with my dad, so I had a kind of a, a background relationship, so to speak, with the ocean out of San Pedro, Newport, and Dana Point when it was built, and places like that. And um, I was um, out of undergraduate, and Mia, I support you in your geography aims because I was a geography undergrad. And Thanks, Hans. <laughs> following which, I was a carpenter for 12 years in the Bay Area. And I enjoyed that. That was great work. I had no idea there was anything like underwater archaeology, nautical archaeology, until I saw an advertisement in the paper and took a field school from East Carolina University up in the Great Lakes doing the history and archaeology of submerged shipwrecks from the 19th century. Wow. And I found it fascinating, and I caught the history bug. I used to tell my students, if you're going to catch a bug, catch the bug for dentistry. <laughs> Don't catch the bug for history. You'll be working two days a week. No, that's not fair to dentists. <laughs> they, they, they work very hard. But uh, I caught the history bug and ended up going to the master's program at East Carolina, one of the few places to go. That's kind of the terminal degree in underwater archaeology. The working degree is master's. Oh. I went on and got a PhD in history at University of Hawaii studying the maritime history of the Asia Pacific region. Wow. And um, was working on creating a position at the university when NOAA came knocking. So the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries manages uh, marine areas and Great Lakes areas for their special ecosystem characteristics, their natural resources, but also for their archaeological, historical, right. and cultural resources. And so sanctuaries was beginning to wrap up, ram up, ramp up that effort in 2002 and brought a number of trained archaeologists on board, myself and others, and we've been there ever since, um, contributing to the assessment of historic properties mm. and cultural resources throughout the national system. And in fact, we're within the Papahanao Makuakea Marine National Monument now, there is also a sanctuary designation process going on for this monument. Mm -hmm. And I know that sounds a bit like layering, you know, one protection upon another, but the difference between a national monument, Marine National Monument, and a sanctuary is a sanctuary is an act of Congress and has longer lasting protections. And so mm -hmm. we think it will bring better, longer lasting protections to this very special area, which is um, a place of incredible natural resources and wonders and uh, very culturally very sacred to Native Hawaiians and also has a history mm -hmm. extending back through the guano period in the 19th century, extending through the whaling era, 
when the whalers came out of New England and New Bedford into the Pacific. Wow. Many of them were lost in the atolls here. Mm. And then, of course, participation, uh, the role in World War II and the major battle, wow. the Battle of Midway. Most of my archaeology in this monument over the last 10 or 15 years, uh, 20 years, has been closer to the atolls and shallower waters. So it's a bit different mm -hmm. to be out here supporting deep ocean work. Mm. Um, but there are incredible resources, both natural and historical and cultural. All right. And all those need to be considered. Yeah. Can I ask you what your first archaeology um, archaeological dig was it? Do you call it a dig or do you call it a, a oh. site? <laughs> I'm not <laughs> even sure what the term is. Very are. cold water dive. Oh yeah, Lake wow. Superior, probably the wooden schooner called the Lucerne, mm. and Lucerne was in relatively shallow water, 30 feet. One of those um, oar carrying wooden schooners back in the day. The, uh, a huge winter storm, a whiteout storm, blew up. The vessel went into the shoals, broke its back, broke its keel on the shoal, but they were too far from shore. The surf was too great. Mm. The crew had to climb into the rigging, and they found them a couple days later covered in about four inches of ice. Wow. So sometimes shipwreck sites have tragic grisly tales to tell. Yeah. Was it difficult, like... Was it, what was the training like? Was, were you training on the job or with that first wreck or um, were you kind of flying solo already? Oh, it was definitely a field course for introductory maritime archaeology students. And I wasn't even really enrolled in the university at that point. So it was hands-on training. Mm. Jump in with both feet, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. Thanks so much. And um, Upashana, if you're free. Uh, feel free to share your story too. How did you become a coral, deep sea coral specialist? I wouldn't call myself a specialist, but yeah, uh, it's it's a it hasn't been a very uh, straightforward journey or a smooth one in that sense. I think like a lot of us. So uh, growing up, I have always been very interested in uh, natural sciences, uh, conservation sciences, and that's all that I've always wanted to do, be involved in nature conservation and anything of that sort. And just accordingly, and I was that outdoorsy kid who would love doing, running around, exploring places, and uh, obviously my exposure to the marine biology or the deep sea was through the innumerable um, documentaries that I think a lot of us have watched growing up. But I never really thought that that's something uh, that is possible to right. work on. And uh, as I mentioned previously that I am from Cal Kolkata, a city in eastern India. So I didn't know anybody around or I never really came across anybody around me who had worked on marine biology, let alone the deep sea. So in my idea, it was something that is too fantastic <laughs> to actually do, that real people don't do that. That's probably <laughs> what I would think as a kid. But at the same time, I wanted to work with animals, with organisms for conservation, for protection. That was always there. And at the same time, um, that is not a very conventional career, career choice. And uh, my family, my parents, they have been supportive. They are quite progressive. But at the same time, there has always been a lot of flack. And uh, honestly, like I think growing up, I would generally be ridiculed for these choices because why would the youngest daughter in the family want to do something like this and <laughs> this is probably that she's going to grow out of and will not eventually <laughs> do but and everybody as I started growing up uh, I ended up disappointing I think most of my extended family members and everybody around that they thought that oh no this is not something that she's growing out of then this <laughs> is not something possible 
So, so it it has been. I mean, I'm saying it like this, but it has been quite a bit of a struggle internally, also. You know, holding on to what you really want to do, mm. and yeah. uh, still, you know, because it gets difficult when nobody around you really understands that, or in the sense that, uh, oh, that's not for you to do. Like you have, you can do other things. You have better career choices in terms of uh, social constructs, what are considered better, and everything. So eventually I studied uh, zoology for my bachelor's, uh, which was in India, and I got involved in various sorts of uh, wildlife conservation projects. For a while I was involved with a tiger conservation project. And then I wanted to go on and uh, study wildlife conservation. We had a couple of institutes then in India, I think two, where they offered a master's in uh, wildlife conservation, oh. but they didn't offer it every year. And uh, so they were very good institutes. And to one of them I applied, got through the first round of examinations and everything. And then there was, uh, I think the second or the third round of applications was uh, where we had to send in recommendation letters. And uh, then later I got to know that my application got cancelled because one of the one of the faculty in my college who was supposed to send the uh, recommendation letter didn't send it in the correct format. Oh no! So I was like, okay, that was devastating because that's that is exactly what I wanted to do and I didn't right. really think anything else. And there weren't any other places then to do or to study wildlife conservation as such. And most of the zoology master's courses were more heavy on microbiology, biochemistry. And uh, I'm not a biologist who enjoys working on any of those fields. I'm going to <laughs> be very <tiny> honest. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so that, and then, Again, by chance, I got to know that the university where I had done my undergrads, it's a good university, it's the University of Calcutta, and I didn't want to do their zoology masters. They had a marine science program, oh. which I didn't know. And uh, then I, I was like, okay, fine, I'll go ahead and apply for it. And at that time, I was so demoralized that I was like, I'm not going to get into that. But I did, and then I ended up doing the master's there, and uh, my dissertation project was on phytoplankton, and so plankton. <laughs> and that was... <laughs> and now you're like, <laughs> we, never we again. You say phytoplankton. <laughs> 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 not, not, no more phytoplankton for you, right? Like, yeah, I mean, I enjoyed <laughs> the project. It was, it, yeah, it was, yeah, it was a good project. And I used to work in the mangroves, because we uh, oh. Calcutta is very close to one of... Not one of, I think it is, the largest mangrove in the world, the Sundarban mangrove system. Oh. And I enjoy working there. And I have also worked there after that. And sometime I really want to go back and continue working in that habitat. Yeah. Uh, but cool. yes, and then I was like, no, I, my in, I was interested in the deep sea. I did not know that even then that I can actually do it. And then I wanted to pursue more, get into growth my PhD in grad school, but there weren't much options in India. I looked, there were a few labs that worked on shallow water corals, uh, but uh, they, were, they were either full, not taking grad students then, or uh, funding situation, something or the other. Mm -hmm. And also from when I was quite young, I would say high school or maybe younger, I've been actively involved in animal rescue and rehabilitation. So. There was a lot related to that that I have been doing since then. And uh, so that was a priority that, okay, I can't just leave the country without that. I mean, that that's a big responsibility. So I needed some time to take care of that. And then I started applying outside. And my advisor, Dr. Franz, everybody in the deep sea community knows that he is uh, a, a very renowned deep sea biologist and doctor coral specialist. Mm -hmm. and uh, I had come across his work, I was aware of his work, and I was like, oh, this person is never going to take me in his lab. Uh, but, but I still emailed him. Yeah. And uh, I think he did not respond for like a couple of months. And I assumed that, yes, that's obvious. Why would he respond to my email? 
and then I was at a conference and I suddenly get this email from him that I'm so sorry uh, for some reason I lost your email it went oh. into the uh, spam folder or something mm -hmm. happened mm -hmm. so then he wanted to meet so we met over skype for a couple of times so a couple of rounds of interviews applied for uh, the university and got through and then i ended up here started working on this and i come from an ecology background i did not have any phylogenetic background uh -huh. uh, working in phylogenetics or evolution and I, I told him this and uh, at that point i had a dog which uh, was uh, he was he was a rescue he I rescued him when he was six seven years old he had a broken vertebral column so he was paralyzed mm. so I told him in the first interview that I mean that was another reason why I didn't want to move outside of India mm -hmm. but then when I thought that a guy will initially the plan was I'll bring him with him but he was already quite old almost 12 13 years and I told him I remember that I need to find somebody who can take care of him when I'm gone like he'll be at home with my parents but mm -hmm. somebody to come and uh, be like a caretaker for him mm -hmm. and if I can't then I'm not coming he's like yeah I understand that so I think uh, that was also a big re reassurance that okay this is another this is a person that I can work with that we kind of operate on the same bandwidth and I ended up here and it has been a great experience in that lab I have learned a lot in the last five five and a half years and still learning it's an ongoing process and i hope to continue in the field of deep sea and at the same time i want to move back to india at some point and continue research there because i feel that there's a lot that can be done and that needs to be done mm -hmm. and we have a very long coastline and the indian ocean is highly understudied okay. and uh that's another process how to about like I have to figure out how to do that how to facilitate that because there's hardly any infrastructure for deep sea studies there so sometimes I wonder that maybe I'll not be able to continue in this field eventually and maybe we'll have to move to shallower ecosystem which is fine I enjoy that also but I hope that somehow happens and I don't know there's a lot that needs still needs to be figured out but yeah, yeah that's been most more still a lot of possibilities yeah. Yeah. <laughs> except for the phytoplankton that is, yeah. not, a <laughs> that is not a possibility <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> yeah it has to be we something understand. you we can understand. hold in your hand <laughs> yes plankton no but everything <laughs> <laughs> plankton people will come running after <laughs> <laughs> well maybe you'll be leading the way in non-plankton research yeah. <laughs> and you manifested your rock that <laughs> yesterday so you know <laughs> yeah. you're you're a powerful manifester don't don't doubt yourself <laughs> yeah. 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 thank yeah. you so much for sharing thank that journey you. like well you your, know. your family must be proud of you yes i I'm hope sure they so are. i'm sure i they are. hope so i don't know <laughs> I think we are not a family of people who are very expressive, so I don't know. <laughs> a typical Indian family, probably. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think another moral from your story or takeaway for any, especially students listening, is um, make sure if you don't hear a response from professor or someone who you're trying to contact, um, follow up, right? Yeah. And don't take it personally. You know, they might no, be busy. No, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And just keep trying to reach out. Yes. So that was really great that that was how you made that connection. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Well, thanks so much for Thank sharing. You. Um, would you like to also share a little bit about your journey, Taylor Ann? Sure. That was a beautiful story. Thank you for sharing that journey. Yeah. Um, mine is different, but similar in its origins of me just being an explorer uh, as a kid. Just always wanting to be outside and playing in the mud. Uh, I grew up in the Midwest, so I did not grow up near the ocean, but I did go to Lake Michigan a lot, Lake Superior a couple times. Um, so that's where my first love of water came from. Mm. Um, but when I went to college in, uh, what, geez, 2014 now, um, I did not know what I wanted to study. Uh, I knew I had a passion for nature, a passion for art, uh, just for people. Um, but I wasn't sure how those things came together. Yeah. Um, so I went to college and kind of flipped around with majors. I was a pre-vet major because I loved animals. I thought I wanted to mm. be a veterinarian. And mm -hmm. then I realized I just wanted to own all of the animals, not uh, <laughs> have, perform surgery on them. Um, so then I switched to biology. I also switched to telecommunications because I thought I wanted to be a documentarian for mm. um, ocean or, or any other type of nature documentaries. 
Um, but then I think one day I just sat down and kind of had to soul search and figure out, okay, why am I here? I'm 18, um, 19 years old. I need to figure out my life, you know, that's everybody's kind of <laughs> pathway. Um, and I just wasn't sure. So I sat down and watched a documentary. I watched Mission mm. Blue uh, oh, on Mission Netflix. Blue. And yeah. um, Sylvia Earle's story really, really inspired me. Um, I saw what one woman could do to really yeah. make a change um, in the minds of people and their hearts um, and encourage them to care about the ocean. So right then and there, I changed my major back to biology. I was going to undergrad in Indiana, so I didn't have the option of marine science at the time. So I just, you know, dedicated myself to that degree until I could apply for internships and eventually hopefully get a marine science internship. But it took me forever, a lot of no's. Uh, yeah. I applied to a lot of things. Um, got told yes a couple of times too, but uh, in marine science, there's not a lot of money yeah. in terms of internships. So mm -hmm. that was a huge roadblock for me as somebody who was born in like lower class family uh, to a single mom, like mm -hmm. yeah, that was just not a possibility. So. It was kind of crazy, actually, how I ended up getting here. If you want the long story, <laughs> it comes from my ancestry. So I took an ancestry DNA test, wow. met a long-distance cousin, and found out that she also loved the environment and had a really, really, really huge heart to, you know, try to help save the world. <laughs> Honestly, that's just kind of how <laughs> yeah. I am, too. Um, and we really connected uh, over social media. And I told her about, you know, my pursuits and... She was gonna help me try to figure out a program where I could do marine science. So she sent my resume around to a couple people and told me to apply to a couple programs and I never thought I would get into any of them. <laughs> mm. uh, but I did and I got into this place called Duke Marine Lab oh, and I didn't Duke. know what awesome. it was. <laughs> I thought it was in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I got in and I was really surprised. Um, so when I went there, that was when I got my first actual opportunity to wow. do an independent research project in marine science, connect with other people interested in marine science. Um, and yeah, I got to do a whole semester there and got to take a trip to Panama to do research wow. too. So it was awesome. like a huge life-changing opportunity for me. Yeah. All because I met this random cousin online who this is <laughs> told me she would help for me. This is not Ancestry.com either. <laughs> we are not. Yeah, Ancestry <laughs> is not an ad, but you can hit me up if you want. Um, don't take this for free though. <laughs> oh, that's the story a great, is mine. That's a great um, <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah, so um, yeah, my cousin, her name is Catherine Coleman Flowers. Um, and yeah, we met in 2017. And uh, yeah, her, her, my relationship to her really opened that door for me, which was yeah. really cool. Um, so yeah, my time at Duke, I got to do a project and I took this really cool class called Invertebrate Zoology. And I was like super geek to finally get my hands on marine creatures and yeah. microscope so and fun. the whole <laughs> world that I had like, been nope. dreaming of, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and the professor I had for that class was super, super awesome. She was really, really kind to me. Let me ask her all these questions nice. and come in the lab on the weekends and use microscopes and look at organisms. Awesome. Um, and yeah, I didn't really know who she was, uh, but she was really nice to me. And she started to show us this deep sea collection she had. And I was like, what? You went there? <laughs> you went to the deep sea? How? Like. <laughs> And she told me about uh, like who she was and she piloted the Alvin submarine wow. and she was the first woman to ever do that. Her name is Dr. Cindy Lee Vandover. Wow. Um, and yeah, so her and I just started talking about the deep sea. She let me ask her all these questions and she told me about uh, all these different programs and the Nautilus OET being one of them. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I was just like so impressed and just shocked that these things even existed. Uh, right and that they paid you to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that made a huge difference for me. Like that was an internship that, you know, I applied for and I did not think I was gonna get. Uh, right. I was so nervous during the interview. I didn't have the marine background, even though I had a biology background and I had a little experience at Duke, uh, I wasn't sure. I, I knew that this was a really big deal. <laughs> mm. um, so yeah, just kind of had my fingers crossed, but didn't really think I'd get it. That's awesome. Um, now you've been with Nautilus for like so many yeah, years now. And then, yeah, <laughs> came in 2019 and yeah. I've been here ever since. That's yeah. pretty so exciting. Cool. Yeah. yeah. We're so passing 2,000 meters, so we're going to be coming up on the bottom yeah. pretty soon. in another yeah. 180 meters, okay. folks. Yeah, we have about cool. five minutes left, so. Five minutes till bottom. Five or six minutes. Awesome. And it sounds like 
just to recap from both of your stories, Upashana and Taylor Ann, sounds like you applied to something and you're like, I'm not going to get it. Yeah, but, I was thinking that. But I then you got it, so. Yeah. <laughs> I think that. Uh, yeah, I was going to add. That trait yeah. just stays on. I think I'm still the same. Like yeah, I, I still feel that way yeah. all the time. <laughs> and yeah. Still worth a try, though. If you're listening and you're thinking of applying for something, like just definitely. Yeah, try it. Yeah, out. lead me in the your last for sure. So, oh, yeah. in five minutes, I'm going to be pretty busy dealing with stuff. I was we hit the bottom, but I just wanted to say quickly that I uh, applied to the National Geographic Geography internship. It's one of the few paid in internships. When I was an undergrad, I didn't get it. I reached out. I saw that one of the people. Um, was a Miami graduate. I reached out and I ended up getting it when I was in the summer between my first and second years of grad school. And um, awesome. yeah, so it ended up working out great. I got to uh, interview Sylvia Earl there during wow. the summer and I had no idea who she was because I wasn't an ocean person. So yeah, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, but yeah. Did I just hear that correctly? You did. I, yeah, so. And then I got to see her again at a AAG, a geography conference. And that's also when I finally got to meet Jane Goodall, who I always oh, yeah. looked up to. I used to oh, want to be a primatologist. Yeah. Um, I can tell the story later more. Yeah, um, I want to know that story. Indeed. So yeah, yeah, I will. Yeah, that's We're about really four minutes story. from the bottom. Right. So, so we'll later when we have yeah. some time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And what I liked about Taylor's story is that I also wanted to be a veterinarian when I was <laughs> little. I mean, that's how it starts for everybody that that's how we know, and then yeah. I figured out. Oh, I don't want to like treat people's fan people's fancy pets. I want to actually work with animals and conserve them and work for them. So I'm going to go into like conservation. And I was little. I don't know how I figured out that logic. Right. I had this conversation with another friend of mine who was also probably nine years old, and we had this very deep conversation. Mm -hmm. and I was like, okay, so no, most because veterinarians that I saw around were just treating pets, right? Right. So I'm like, no. Either I'm going to be a wildlife veterinarian or I'm going to go into wildlife conservation so that I can work with vets. So I don't know how I figured that out yeah. then. I'm not that logical now. I, yeah, I don't right. know either. I have to actually jump off. Um, we're doing a ship to shore call with some high school students. I'll be out of uh, the control van for about 30 minutes, but I'll pass it over to Elsa who will uh, continue chatting with you guys. Awesome. Have a good See interaction. See you in a bit, Kara. See you in a bit. Bye-bye. 100 more meters. We have folks listening in from different countries, I'll say. That's always exciting. Yeah, so as you know, Nautilus is a 24-hour operation. So on all of our watches, we have the opportunity to um, really reach people from all over the world. So we have uh, people in the United States, Australia, and the United Kingdom, as well as um, in Europe. So the Netherlands, Italy, Germany. Norway, and then uh, we actually have some uh, Asia Pacific countries here as well. So I see Singapore, the Philippines, um, and also uh, French Polynesia. So that's uh, Tahiti is in French Polynesia. So uh, Aroha <laughs> to the Pacific Islanders out there. Um, we are in the middle of the Pacific Ocean again in Papahanaumokuakea. National Marine uh, Marine National Monument. Um, so this is a protected area in the oceans of Hawaii, and it's really a privilege for us to be here. Um, uh, it's been our voyage has been the result of a great partnership between um, OET and NOAA and the um, Papa Hanamokuakea um, Board, and we've just been really lucky to see what we've seen in um, the ocean here. And we are nearing um, ocean bottom. Well, we see things for the first time. That's quite amazing. Right. This particular seamount has had one dive on it, but that was the south side. Mm -hmm. 
working up a very steep cliff a number of years ago we are on the east side now and our dive track over the next several watches has never been seen before yeah. in fact has never been lit up by any lights before mm -hmm. and so what you will see with us will be seen for the first time we're curious here how what the similarities are and what the differences are from our last uh, seamount, King George seamount. So that will be interesting to see. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Is it Loudon? I Loudon think they've been saying it's Loudon. Yeah. Loudon. Yeah. And, um, Named for a fur trading ship in the 18th century, actually. Interesting. There's a historical tidbit. Yeah. Not like plankton, but. Thank you, Hans. And you know, it's a great, it's always great to have an interdisciplinary team. So we have all the different tidbits from all, um, geography, history, biology um, out here. So keeping yeah. it interesting. Yep. 2,141 meters. So we've got 40 meters to go. In fact, we're beginning to see the bottom now. The two lit green lasers are on. That's for scale. Those are 10 centimeters apart. Looks like a sandy bottom. Looks so. Yes, the bottom is inside, and I can all we can already see there's something there. I did see a, a fish on the screen. Yeah, there was a fish swimming by, probably uh, Ophidiformis related to the Cascades. We're still a little high up off the bottom, so we're not seeing in detail yet. But this looks like a fairly steep climb up a yeah. slope, at least for our watch. Looking at how sedimented the seafloor looks, we can be hopeful to see a couple of sea cucumbers. Yep. One of the standing objectives for this dive is to, you know, collect a rock sample somewhere at the beginning of the dive. And of course, we're not going to see one right around here in the sediment, but if we do find one that uh, is suitable, mm, right. then we, we may take that. That's a, a priority for the mission. The rock samples help us date the seamounts and trace their origins in geologic time to where they may have come from originally, the original magma plume that is beneath uh, the oceanic plate. And one of our two science chairs, our, our lead scientists, Val is the geologist. The other is Mike Brennan, who is an archeologist with Search Incorporated. So Hans, I know we were talking about uh, on one of, on our other dive nodules, and um, I'm not sure if you'd be able to kind of give us an explanation. Or um, I know that we're collecting geological sa so mm -hmm. angular rocks, mm -hmm. and then another type of sample we're looking for for the geological study is um, nodules. Um, would you be able to? Expand on that a little bit. I know you're not the geology lead. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So if all the geologists out there can take a coffee <laughs> break, I will say something about that because I have to stretch back to my undergraduate <laughs> geology 101 days, and we are talking 1981. Right. But uh, the, the the ferromanganese nodules are of interest because the, of the topic of deep sea mining mm. ah. and the the kind of uh, growth. Uh, the, the chemical growth that happens around the, the rock is rich in minerals like, like cobalt and copper and manganese 
and other essential metals uh, right. for our society today. So the issue of seabed mining is quite topical, controversial in some Indeed. areas. And so we're interested in sampling those when we see them, but they're not everywhere. Um, usually they look quite different from rocks. They're kind of like a round sort of puff ball. I've heard, I heard, I think Val described them as, you know, rock with icing all over it. Mm, um, okay. Kind of a round bubble, little nodules. Sometimes you find them spread across sediment areas. So we did not see many on our first dive on King George Seamount on other rocks, but there'll be places, I think, during this dive, maybe not on our watch, maybe between waypoints two and three or three and four, where we'll, after climbing the slope, we'll dip down into a saddle. Mm. And those saddles may have pockets of sediment and they may be good collection places for these nodules. There's a scoop on the ROV and we'll be able to scoop some of them up. That's something that Val and other geologists would like to look at. All right. We'll do uh, our best for Val. Yes. No, uh, we have the bottom end side, and we can already see numerous uh, sea fans on the seafloor. Oh. And uh, from we, we are still not in a position to have a closer look at them. But from what I can see, they look like uh, Halipteris or Baltasina uh, vips and there is an umbilula like colony on the left. Mm -mm. I would guess once ROVs make the descent is that there's some buoyancy trimming going on and some adjustment. I think that'd be usual. In CAM 2, you see the view from overhead from the Atalanta. That's the second vehicle, the second body in this two vehicle system. The Atalanta holds the cable from the ship and kind of you'll, you'll see in the Atalanta view more up and down movement. That's the ship movement on the sea surface, but it dampens that movement out. The umbilical from the Atalanta to the Hercules the ROV on CAM 2 that you can see then is doesn't experience that. Mm. And the 30 foot or so tether from Atalanta to Hercules doesn't have all that weight of the heavy cable hanging those mm. thousands of meters in the ocean. That means Hercules is freer to uh, maneuver and hover and do what it needs to do. So it's, um, it's an efficient yeah. and effective system quite a smart bit of engineering there. And again, I am not a marine engineer <laughs> or ROV <laughs> operator, so all of those folks, please close, close and take a poppy break if I uh, <laughs> venture into the domain of explaining things where I, I know very little. That's a bad habit of mine. No, well, you know, Hans, I think some people um, find it best to uh, the way that they like to explain things is by correcting others, and sometimes we have to be the sacrificial <laughs> lamb to bring that up. But I think you've gotten everything right so far. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. If you don't know something, just teach it. <laughs> oh, I found that works out for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see uh, several kinds of sea pens. see pen party going on there <laughs> and we have a uh, what looks like a synaphobranchid eel swimming by and then is that a coral in the background or yeah i can i think that's a hard to fan tell. like structure i'm not sure if that is what it is or it's a shadow of something so ah right So sea pens are would be closely related to what type of animal? Um, they are corals. They corals, are octocorals. Yes. So all the bigger sea fans that we have been seeing. Right. So they are most closely related to those, uh, but not to the mandrapora or the 
analopsymia that we have been seeing. Those right. are hexachorals. Right. Yes, so these definitely look like Baldacina, C pen webs. I remember seeing uh, footage from the Pacific before where they have come across huge fields of uh, these C pens mm, okay. more densely. More densely populated. More than densely populated, screen, yes. Yeah. Sorry, I sometimes stop mid sentence to stare at things. <laughs> I think I, I saw. Quite a view. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think I saw something that could have been a sea cucumber, but we can have a look at those later. We will see it. Yes. I heard there was some debate on an earlier organism about whether it was a sea cucumber or a nudibranch. Yeah, I'm I don't know if that was ever. I've not seen the image of that sea cucumber slash nudibranch, <laughs> the one. <laughs> the controversial. The controversial. <laughs> yeah, I also the have that. The transparent bunny? The transparent was a nudibranch. No, new that, that was that for was sure. Yeah. Yeah. Nudibranch, I yeah. It's I saw one. For sure one. the transparent bunny is a nudibranch. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you see, I'm learning things. Well, somebody's oh, no, living around so here. So sorry, it was a either a nudibranch or a pleurobranch was also the. Uh, oh. Yeah. I think yeah. that is probably difficult to. We have a understand arm. from a uh, video footage. I am. Woo. You got this. You know, Ed writes everything out sentence by sentence, so. <laughs> oh, I think what they're doing is white balancing the camera. Ah. Let me know when I'm good to go. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so on every dive, it's a delicate operation with a great team working together in tandem. So in the front row, we have our Atalanta pilot, our ROV pilot, and our navigator. Am I good to go? Oh. We also have our video engineer working together with them. And then in our second row, we have our data logger, our watch lead and science lead, and then our science communication fellow um, making it all happen. I am impressed with the coordination it takes to orchestrate the movements of the ship on the surface, Atalanta, and cable tether management with the tether down to the Hercules. Right. It's yeah, and my apologies, I forgot to have one very important member of the team, which is the uh, ship captain. They are on the bridge. They're not in the control room with us, but they're on the bridge, and they are um, captaining the ship in that coordination with the navigator, who then coordinates with the pilots uh, to make sure it all moves together smoothly. Manning the helm. Yes. Operating the thrusters, dynamic positioning thrusters All right. for the ship to maintain position. Yes, so the nature of a ship is that when you stop, you, you're not really stopped. You have to constantly be um, changing position according to wind and waves. Um, and also what's happening at the bottom as well. So very impressive. I could not do that <laughs> for sure.
So, yeah, speaking of ships, we have a question about whether we get seasick while we're on the boat. And the answer is yes, <laughs> which it's very, very normal. It takes a bit of uh, getting used to. And eventually you get used to it, but yes, with the help of medications <laughs> yeah, and I also think it's sleep. The first couple of days is a little rough for everybody, Indeed, depending yeah. on the weather. Yes. And a lot of things, but then you get used to yeah, it. Yeah, you get yeah. your sea legs exactly. after two or three <laughs> exactly. days. Exactly. While you get your sea legs. And in fact, you get so used to that, by the time you get back to port and step on the dock, now you, you have, you you have to get your land, land legs, legs back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because it'll feel very yeah. strange to yeah. walk down a solid surface that's And which not is moving. not moving. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you can actually walk in a straight line. You don't want to walk, you yeah. don't have to walk zigzag True. to mm -hmm. keep a uh, keep walking on a straight line. Yeah. I have experienced that after a day on a little boat, so I'm wondering what how severe it will be when we get back to port oh, um, after severe. this uh, month-long we'll journey. We'll carry you. <laughs> <laughs> and also I feel that when I go to sleep the first couple of nights after I return, it always feels like the bed's rocking uh, a little bit. Yep. Everything's moving. Yep. Yeah, so um, we are lucky to be able to be out here in the ocean. Um, exploring but yes it does take um getting used to and then also uh coordination once you get the rovs um of course all the deck work is having to be done with those conditions and then the lab work as well so while we were processing our samples from the last dive there was a bit of uh moving around in the lab but it got done <laughs> Uh, and we were able to process all of those samples successfully and we're really grateful for um, everything we're going to learn from those. Yeah. Did the rocks get sliced? Cut yes. Into? Uh, pretty cool. Again, not a geologist. You know, we always have to have that disclaimer. Um, but yeah, Val and uh, Hannah, our other geology um, student here on board, were able to slice the rocks. And I'm not quite sure what exactly they're looking at, but I know they slice them, some they crush, there's a lot of different processing. And of course they take photos of the rocks as well. I'd like to take a look, that'd yeah. be great. Yeah, Yeah. you know, the, the Nautilus is outfitted fairly comfortably. I mean, the, the food is very good. Uh, the berths are, are comfortable, but it is life at sea. So um, quarters are small and the vessel's under constant movement. We're fortunate to have fairly good weather right now, but you know that can change. Sea states can come up, wind can pick up, and there are signs all over the place, like by the small step-in shower that says, yeah. "Please use caution, Be careful. extreme caution in rough yes. weather, taking a shower because there's nothing in there to hold on to, and you will you will bounce a around like a tennis ball in the dryer." <laughs> Ah, uh, yes. Uh, quite a good way to describe it. <laughs> well, that's, that's probably a better way. <laughs> no, no, indeed. It, it is, it is. Um, and we do have a fitness center on board, and that has been quite a challenge, um, working out while that's the ship right. is moving. I like how you keep yeah. calling it the fitness, fitness center. center. <laughs> it's good, it's good. That's good. Uh, it's a nice room with weights and machines, yes. so... But it yeah, when the vessel's moving and you're on the elliptical or the yeah. rolling machine, it's... It's, it's not it's awkward the safest also to, probably. yeah, it's a little, it's quite different. I think that was a shrimp that, or it might have been a shrimp. Probably. Yeah. I also see a prototype uh, on the sea floor. Yeah, yeah, that's another kind of a sea pan. The more stiff looking one, more towards the bottom of the screen. Ah, I see it. I don't know why, I just thought we'd be coming down in a rocky area, but that's just the experience of the first dive for me, I guess. And this is also the probably the bottom so of the sea mount, mm. so that's why it's heavily sedimented, base. yeah. I have a really bad as idea. As we start moving up. Yeah, that's why the last uh, dive felt really special. Bad idea includes turning off all the lights. 
ended with just nothing On but Hercules. beautiful coral fields and gardens of different species. We were spoiled. We really were. Yeah. Are you? Uh, are now you we're recording? Uh, new type of habitat. That'll be cool. Atlantis video right now. Yeah. Uh, back row, are you there? Yep. Yes. We're here. You're running the test for Atlantis. Can you make a note that <coughs> that's what Hercules looks like from? 22 meters altitude with no lights on. Roger. 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 20 meters. Let's just come down to make it 20. 20 meters at a land of view, no Hercules lights. Yeah, and um, that is actually indeed. So that's Argus at, uh, oh, I don't know, 25 meters altitude. And uh, Hercules is, I don't know, maybe 10 meters away from. Anyways, you get the idea. Yes. So 15 meters up, we can barely pick up Hercules from Atalanta. That's uh, Argus, 25 meters Argus. altitude. Yeah. And Hercules is three meters altitude. So the top of Hercules is five meters approximately. So at the bottom of Atalanta is uh, 20 meters away from the top of Hercules. 20 meters, barely making out the image. I don't know about you, but I can't see a lot. Yeah. Maybe yeah. you can see that there's something, but if you didn't know, it would be difficult. What's that? It's, it's not very detailed. It's yeah. not detailed. Just because we know that Hercules is there, we can make out a shape, but if we walked in and didn't know that Hercules was there. That's also Hercules as, uh, you know, light reflective exactly, paint on the yeah. top of it. Brand yeah, new paint. that adds to it. Great. Yeah. For <laughs> folks watching, we're testing the video capacity, the capabilities for the, the upper vehicle. And uh, 20 meters above, we're just not picking up much detail of resolution. And uh, the water column seems fairly clear. Uh, uh, water here is exceptionally clear yeah, at the moment, yeah. I thought. And uh, seabed, as you saw, surrounding was a, uh, you know, white, muddy, reflective seabed as right. well. Right. Are we able to either bring Hercules up five meters? To I'll see come what down. it is at 15 or come down with I'll the come down with Atalanta until it... Uh, yeah. Let's let's see what that is. The uh, tethers, you know, given us a little. It's taken all the limelight. So that's Atalanta at a twenty meter altitude. So that's. Uh, the top of Hercules, probably 15 meters from the bottom of Atlant Atlanta. Yeah. But we're heaving up and down uh, two meters. The reason we're doing this, for folks watching, is we're just curious about the capacity for Atlanta to operate as a vehicle itself and record the bottom. So it's just a bit of a test. Is that uh, sufficient there with the uh, video? I don't know if you got any stills or... Yeah, I'm taking captures back here. You know, um, you're so happy with that? About 15 meters above. And we've got a still. Can we get 10 meters above? And is that the NOAA um, logo there? that I can see or barely. I'm trying to describe the, the little details that I can barely see. Some type of logo. There's something, some logo on the front of Hercules, which is visible now, but not legible. Again, like Dan mentioned, the reflective paint on Hercules mm -hmm. makes Helps, it easier yeah. to spot it. That's yeah. uh, getting close to 10 meters there. My Delta's showing 13. 13, the bobbing up and down. Uh, 
We're looking at the stern of Hercules. That's better, so that's about 10 meters above. Can we get a still? Okay, thank you. That is uh, 10 meters lower than we typically go uh, with Atlanta. Gotcha. So it's bouncing there. So we'd say 10 meters above Hercules, maybe 15 Yeah, it's, above. well, we're heaving up and down. Yeah. Two meters, so it's bouncing between 10 and 12, 10 and 13 as the vessel heaves. Yeah. Well, that gives me a good idea. So that's, you know, 20, 15, and 10. And, you know, certainly at about 10 meters above the top of Hercules, there's detail. But at 20 meters above the top of Hercules, very little. Very little. It's almost uh, impossible to see Hercules when Atlanta yeah. is 20 meters above, but yeah. 10 is... And we've got the stills to back it up. Exactly. Okay. I'd say we're complete. You're good. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dan. Coming Thank up. you. Yeah, my pleasure. All right. Boom. How much light changes everything. <laughs> Figured it out, yeah. Fill your boots. It's also worth noting that the altimeter on Atalanta is uh, very analogish, so it's um, it's not like our sub-bottom profiler in Argus, where we get a good, really good return. It's mm. a single beam, and it's um, because Atalanta pitches when the vessel rolls. The yeah. number is all over the place, so yeah. it's. Uh, uh, Gina, if you're talking, it's I hard to really get a reliable you. altitude. Yeah, no, sorry. Can fine. you repeat that one more time to me? Okay. Sorry, I'll say I thought that it was Gina talking, <laughs> but I could hardly hear you. You might wanna. Yeah, I well, can also yeah, I guess barely hear you. It might be because you switched seats. Look at all those sea pins. Exactly. It's so beautiful. Okay, gauges are good, nav's good, videos pretty good. We're good. Co pilot, you good? Back row? We're yes. good. Ready to rock and roll. As yeah. good as I can be at two in the morning. <laughs> two thirty almost. It's almost two thirty in the morning here. Yeah. We, we uh, don't even. It's hard to say what time it is. Yeah, you can track the line. Yeah, it's you know? crazy boring here. And I think the hardest like part is uh, deciding when to say good morning, and good evening. Right. <laughs> it's meaningless to us now. I'm not even sure what day it is. <laughs> oh, that I'm not. I have no idea. Yeah. Day of the week. I don't know. Date. Oh, what day these are day information day? which are redundant to my brain right now. I don't know. We've been doing these watches forever. I thought yeah. we were going 135. We'll do them forever. Let's go for half a knot. Unless science wants to uh, go slow and look at mud. Uh, I would love to have a close-up of one of the sea pens. Uh, yeah, but let's start it. I Let me, uh, change can my mind. see let's that they are uh, present at a distance also. So. Dang, you're still down under the bus to the bridge like that. 
100 meters. Make make a number up. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> so that really? looks like a bamboo coral whip on that little mound and with uh, what looks like a primnoid fan from a distance. Yeah, that, that definitely is a primnoid fan, both of those. And the white whip, which was uh, closely located to the primnoid fan on the left that looks like a bamboo coral whip. Could be a big Paltasina colony as well, hard to ID from a distance. Or maybe it is part of the primnoid uh, fan itself, it's just a shadow. Hard to tell. It's amazing how you have the how we can see little uh, several rocks play, uh, just scattered over the seafloor and these individual primnoid fans on each of those uh, smaller rocks. They have their own little islands. Exactly. <laughs> all right. Just so you all know, we're moving the ship, so we're ready to roll. This looks like a sea cucumber. On the seafloor. That's not uphill. You can bring your head around to 188. And there's a fish as well. Bring my head around to 188. 188. Yeah. Fish? Bring your head around 188. I might have missed that. The, this one. The dark. Oh no, it's not. It's not. Sorry, it's my eyes playing. <laughs> yeah, it seems to it's pull up. It's 2:30 in the morning. <laughs> Planning to dive off a multi beam. You don't get the, you know, it's 100 meter resolution at this depth, right? So it's just a local hill of it. Raj, yeah, oh, I get it, I get it. Uh, can we, is it possible to get a zoom on a couple of these colonies before we move sure. away? Uh, maybe this one over here and any one of these which are on the seafloor. Go ahead, Tina, you can zoom in there. Zoom in. Oh, I think that is something that is probably a fish on the seafloor. I'm not that wrong. In the top left? Mm. Oh. This is a primnoid. There looks like a... small red recruit of a... Some kind of a octocoral can be a uh, anthomastus, but the primnoid has lots of barnacles growing on it. I need a second here to get the uh, trim styled in. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to land in this mud. Okay. I'm sure I'll plow going up the hill at some point. But. That See looks a like a baby. The red one, the right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That looks like a, a recruit of Anthomastus or Pseudo Anthomastus. This is a nice and beautiful primnoid colony.